Father in heaven, we are in awe at the text. The confusion, the questions, the troubling hearts, the troubled hearts of the disciples, boy, it makes complete sense to us. When the rug is ripped out underneath us, when our life seems to be falling completely apart, when the plans that we have made, the, the goals and the desires have been torn away and our life sometimes seems out of control and in shambles, our hearts rise up with anxiety and trouble often. But you have given us in this text the promise of a secure future. You've given us the promise of a home with you forever. And you have given us a Savior whom we can trust. Oh, Father, I pray that your word will accomplish its perfect work in our lives. For those who need a relationship with Jesus by faith, May today be that day when their eyes are opened, and although they cannot see our Savior physically, they will know him by faith. And they will be born into your family, and they will have a guaranteed eternal future of glory. Maybe that's somebody today. Father, maybe somebody today listening to this text is full of anxiety. The world has come crashing down around them, and they need hope. Give them hope. And Father, for those who life right now doesn't have a lot of problems on the horizon, things are going well, may they be absolutely dependent upon you and your word, lest they fall, lest they become full of pride and thereby begin to wander. Thank you for this text of scripture and for the very words of our Savior. Use it in our life for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are just hours before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It is evening time. They have finished their meal, or they're discussing their meal. We know in John chapter 13 that the night in which the Lord was betrayed They were remembering the Passover feast. They were eating some lamb and having a time of remembrance. It was a joyful remembrance because the years before when Moses led the people out of Exodus, they came out of 430 years of physical slavery. Moses led them out with a mighty hand of God, the splitting of the Red Sea, the crossing of the Red Sea, the arrival, the safety on the other shore. It was a great time of celebration. And all the disciples have been doing this throughout their life, and none of the disciples know this is the Last Supper. We call it the Last Supper because we know it's the Last Supper. They, they have no idea. All they know is they are with Jesus, and they are having a great holiday feast, right? In John 13, the first thing that comes, kind of sounds strange or looks strange is when Jesus lays aside his teaching robes, and he wraps himself with the garment of a, of a servant, And he grabs a basin, fills it with water, and the disciples are like, what are the disciples doing? In Luke 22, they're arguing about who is the greatest in heaven. They've just had the triumphal entry. Everybody has been saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, the King of David, is here. And the disciples are around the the Passover table going, hey, the kingdom's getting started, and Jesus is the king. I, I think Remember what I said last week? Nathaniel's going to say, hey, you guys, of all the disciples, I have no guile in my heart. I am the purest man around. If there's any gonna be, anybody want to be great in the kingdom, it's got to be me. Matthew, the former tax collector, he's like, Nathaniel, be quiet. If, God, if Jesus is going to make anybody great in the kingdom, it's got to be me because I know all the tax codes. I can get around anything. And he needs help devising a tax code for the millennial kingdom. I'm his right-hand man. We need some income then you know what uh, James is going to say. James is like, hey, stop talking, Matthew. I'm the, I'm the favorite of the Lord. We're cousins. We are actually blood-related. And if Jesus is going to have anybody be great, it's got to be me, James. What does John, the twin brother, say? Or the, the other brother? Yeah, the twin. J- John is like, James, there is no way that you're going to be greatest in the kingdom because Jesus always calls me the loved disciple. Hey, by the way, I'm the youngest. And Jesus likes the youngest. And, and then, you know, none of that. Peter says, all right, guys, quiet. Every time Jesus goes someplace important, he brings me. 
I'm kind of like the spokesman for the group. Sure, I don't always say things right, and I talk a lot. But still, I'm kind of like the lead guy, and if anybody is going to be great in the kingdom, it's got to be me. See, this is going on. Meanwhile, everybody has dirty, stinky feet, and Jesus lays aside his robes, uh, his robe of teaching authority, and he, he st- stoops down and he washes their feet. You know, Jesus is showing symbolically that we all need cleansing from sin. And Jesus laid aside the glory of heaven, the worship of heaven. And although he lost no deity, he laid aside his rights and privileges as the God of gods, King of kings, Lord of lords. And he humbled himself, took upon himself human flesh. He added to his full deity, full humanity. And he went to the cross. And by dying on the cross, he has provided a way of spiritual cleansing for all who will believe. So when he gets to Peter's dirty feet, Peter's like, Lord, you, my feet are washing? You will never wash my feet. I don't have any need of cleansing. I can wash my own feet. I can take care of my own cleansing. And many people go to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't need your death on the cross. I can cleanse my own sin. I'm going to do enough good works, pray enough prayers, give enough money. I'm going to do something to cleanse myself. I don't need you, Lord. And what does the Lord say to Peter? Peter, if you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part of me. If you, don't, if you don't receive my spiritual cleansing, you will never, never have a part of fellowship with me. You will perish in your sins, is what he's really saying. It's all symbolic. It's not about dirty feet. It's about spiritual cleansing. And then what does Peter do? See, I love Peter. He's all in. One way or the other, Peter is always in. And so he's all in. He's like, okay, Lord, not my feet only, but my whole body. He just goes from one extreme to the other. Do you know who's getting their feet washed? Judas. Jesus knows. He has known from eternity past that Judas is going to turn on him. He knows it. But he, he washes the feet of Judas. What is Judas thinking? Probably at this part, Judas' heart is so bitter. He's so angry that Jesus is not the king I wanted. Man, I thought, I thought we would have a big kingdom and everybody would be giving us praises as his, le- as his followers and leaders. And like he's washing feet? That's, that's, a, that's a servant job man, I got to get out of this thing while I still can get something. And meanwhile, we know that he's already betrayed Jesus and set up the plot to murder for 30 pieces of silver. And here Jesus is washing his feet. And then at the dinner, after that's done, Jesus announces the first troubling statement, someone, one of you will betray me. And all the disciples are like, one of us? Who, who is it? Nobody knew who. And then Peter's like, John, John. Why does Peter want to know who the betrayer is? Because there's two swords in the upper room. We know that from the Gospel of Luke. There's two swords in the upper room. And I think Peter's thinking, John, get me the name of the betrayer, and one of the 12 is not leaving here alive. I will kill them. I think that's what's going on. And so, you know, John's like, Jesus, who is it? He's leaning on Jesus' breast. Remember how I talked about that last week? And then Jesus says, it is the one to whom I give the sop, which is to the most honored guest of the whole 12, he dips into the haruset, and he gives the sop to Judas Iscariot. And at that moment, as Judas is eating the sop, and the bread and the apple mixture is going down his esophagus, Satan, the wicked angel himself, enters into the body of Judas. And Jesus is God. He knows this. He knows Satan is right next to him now indwelling Judas. And he says, Judas, whatever you will do, do quickly. And Judas takes off, and everybody's confused. Nobody knows what's going on. And it's crazy times in the upper room. Let's begin in John chapter 13, verse 31. He's going now in these next couple of chapters, and only John gives us this information. Jesus is, gonna betr- is going to um, teach the disciples about what is going to happen and what their response to it needs to be. And, and we can learn much about this ourselves. Verse 31. So when he, Judas, had gone out, Jesus said... Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, in Jesus, uh, God will also glorify him, Jesus, in himself, and glorify him immediately. All right, we've got this talk about glory and him and himself and the pronouns and all sorts of things. We'll look at it right again in just a moment, but here's what I think is going on. I think clearly the scriptures, Jesus is saying this, right now is the time for my death and resurrection right now. It's been coming over the last three years. Little by little, the hour has come. It hasn't arrived, hasn't arrived, hasn't arrived. But now that Judas is gone, the betrayal is set in motion. He will get arrested. He will go through the trials. 
He will be found innocent, but he will yet be turned over to the Romans. He will be hanging on the cross. He will pay for our sins, and he will rise from the dead. It is like everything is set in motion. It's like when you, once you tip a domino, it's going to hit the dominoes, and it's all going to come crashing. And Jesus is like, now the Son of Man is glorified. I'm not getting out of it. I'm not going to get the next chariot and get, hey, the next chariot's leaving out of town. I'm taking it. There's no way I'm going through with this. Jesus is like, now I'm going to be glorified. What does it mean to be glorified? Jesus has perfectly obeyed the Father's will. From eternity past, the Father's will is, Jesus, you are going to go to earth. You will take upon yourself human flesh. You will be God in human flesh, and you will never have sinned or disobeyed me. But when you hang on the cross, all of the sin of humanity will be poured upon you, and my anger for sin will be given to you. And I will make you the penalty for man's sin. I will separate myself from you. And then after you have paid for the sin of man, you will, I will raise you from the dead and we will be back in fellowship. All right, that's what it means to be glorified. So Jesus says, right now, I'm going to be glorified. I'm going to die for everybody's sins. Following my father. You know how we glorify the father? We obey him. We follow his will. When you follow his will, you are, you are glorifying the father. You're making, you're making him and his influence and impact great. Not that we make him great, but we're revealing his greatness. Jesus says, I have completely revealed the Father's greatness by obeying him to the last letter. I'm going to die and rise from the dead. And then, and then God the Father says, I'm going to glorify you by raising you, raising you from the dead, saying that you did pay for man's sin. And then you're going to come back to heaven and sit at my right hand, and we will rule and reign forever and ever. It's happening right now. It's exciting. Judas leaves. Jesus is like, all right, in just a few hours, I'm on the cross. But in three days, I'm alive from the dead. He knows it. So this is what's going on. Verse 31 again. He now says to the disciples, now the Son of Man is glorified. Right now I'm going to, in a few hours, die and be raised up. And God the Father is going to be glorified in him, in my obedience. Verse 32. If God is glorified in him, when my Father is glorified by my complete obedience, here's what God's going to do. God the Father will glorify Jesus in himself, raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand of the throne. By the way, how many gods do we serve? One God, three persons. Don't get the idea with the text that there's three separate gods and they're all playing a part in this whole thing. One God, three persons. All right? Yet, in person, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. All right, he keeps going. Verse 33, little children. You know, it's like, Jesus is, what, 30, 33? Maybe his early 30s? What are the disciples? They're teenagers. They're kids. Proctor Rails, they're that age. You know, Jesus is like little children. Why? Beca because he's like, this, the, he's like the dad. And the dad is going to prepare the little kids for a, a divine departure. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. Meaning, hey, he's not dead yet. He's got maybe, what, 8 hours, 10 hours, 12 hours left? Um, less than that now. I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, remember the enemies, the Jews? He said, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I tell you the same thing, he says. All right, where is Jesus going? He's going to the cross, and then he will be gone. He's going to the cross, and then what comes after the cross? Oh, pretty easy, a tomb. And who's, where are the disciples going to be? They're going to be left alone. So Jesus tells them, I am going away, and you cannot follow me. You cannot come. Why? Jesus has to pay for our sins alone. Now, what are the disciples thinking? Here's what the disciples are thinking. Hey, we have followed Jesus for three years everywhere he went. He goes up a mountain, we go. He comes down a mountain, we go. He goes to Jerusalem, we go. He leaves Jerusalem, like, overnight, we go with him. Like, we, he always takes us always takes us and and now he's going someplace and he's not taking us what uh, this is not this is not good news this is bad news for the disciples they have they don't know he's talking about the cross they're thinking man is he going to go back to galilee but he doesn't want to take us this time we've gone three years with him everywhere see they're they're very confused so here's what jesus says in verse 34 like he keeps talking and the disciples stop thinking you ever do that you're hearing a message like maybe even right now and now your mind's already on something else going on today. Stop that. This is what the disciples are doing. Jesus is kind of pouring out his guts, and, and they're like, oh, wait a minute. He's going somewhere? Where, uh, where is he going, and why can't we follow him this time? But here's what Jesus says while they're distracted. 
A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Uh, Jesus doesn't have a stuttering problem. He is saying over and over and over again, you must love one another. It is not optional. While I am gone, before I get back, you have one responsibility, love one another. Right? It's a new commandment. Do you want to know what the old commandment was? Leviticus 19, verse 18, God says this. Leviticus 19, verse 18. You shall love one another as as you love yourself. That was the standard. Love one another as you love yourself. Well, hey, you guys, listen. How do I love myself? Here's how I love myself. I got up first, and I thought about myself. I thought about cleansing my body, putting clothes on my body, and then um, feeding my body, and then getting my body to church. I mean, I was so consumed with myself. I was busy about my needs, my attentions, my direction, my future. My So I'm supposed to love you like I love myself, meaning, boy, I've got to give time and attention into you and love you because as I love myself, I really need to love you and do things for you. That's so that was the standard. Lo- love one another as you love yourself, Leviticus 19.18. Now we get a new commandment. The new commandment, I believe, is the last part. Now we are to love one another as Jesus has loved me. All right, how has Jesus loved me? He did not think of himself at all. He left heaven and the glory of heaven and the angelic worship, and he took upon himself five, okay, ten fingers, two hands, Two feet with ten toes, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Jesus put himself into a human body, fully God, fully man, and walked around on a dusty earth. Well, I mean, come on, what kind of pollution did, well, maybe they didn't have pollution problems in Jerusalem. They had other issues. But, but he's, he's, he's hungry, he's thirsty, he's tired. God, the God who never tires when he creates an entire universe and earth, he now gets tired after a day of ministry. He hasn't eaten in like eight hours, and he's like, my stomach's rumbling. Jesus is fully God, fully man, and he humbles himself. And then he gets stripped naked and put on a cross for everybody to to laugh at and mock at. And and then God the Father lays the weight of sin upon him, and so Jesus pays for our sin. Um, That is how Jesus has loved us. He has given his life for us. He is actually, you know what love is? Love is doing for the benefit of another with no regard of the cost of oneself. Like, if I love you, really love you, I'm not going to say, hey, I'm going to help you with your house project, but then, hey, I want a meal, and I want a couple of bucks, and I want you to put some gas in my tank, then we'll have a deal. That's not love. That's what? That's like work and wages. Love is, I will do good for you and help you with no, no thought of return. To no benefit of myself. I don't get anything out of the deal. Why did Jesus die on the cross? It doesn't make him any better God. It doesn't make him more God. Had he never died on the the cross, he still would be full God. But what does he get out of the deal? He gets you and I. That's all. He gets you and I. He, He gets nothing else. He didn't do it for his own benefit. He did it for us. So when I really love one another... When we really love each other, like, it's action. We are going to be doing things. We're not just going to have a gushy feeling like, oh, I just love my church. I love my church. It's like, hey, I see a need. I'm going to do something. I'm going to give. I'm going to pray. I'm going to encourage. I'm going to write a note. I'm going to give a phone call. I'm going to make a meal. You guys, Melissa had a bad back, and she still does, but she's here. I'm praising the Lord for that. Can I tell you the outpouring of love on, on her and on me and on us and Elias? Like, right, Elias? Meals, people, flowers, prayers, encouragement, cards. It's just like we are humbled. You guys have demonstrated love. It's, it's not just word and tongue, but it's in deed and in truth, like 1 John 3 says. But that, that's what we need to be doing, right? And when we do this, what is the world going to know? That we're the disciples of Jesus. You want people to know you're a Christian? You don't have to wear a cross necklace, Right? You don't have to have a WWJD bracelet, although people don't remember that anymore. That's a long long ago fad. You don't have to have a fish bumper sticker or a fish thing on your car in order for people to know that you're a Christian. 
how, do, how is the world going to know that you're a disciple of Jesus if you demonstrate love to one another this week in this body? That's how they're going to know. You know what? We do this effectively. The people around this church, they're going to be like, what is going on at Faith Baptist? Like, something's happening there. It, 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 that's what's going to happen. People hear stories all the time about how we interact with one another. You fight and divide and destroy. Everybody in the community says, would I go there? No way. I will get devoured, and I don't want to be a part of that. Um, but you, you hear of the love and the devotion and the serving of one another in the body, and everybody is like, man, I'd like to be a part of that. How, how could I be a part of that? Oh, faith in Jesus? Wow, who's Jesus? And you know, see what I'm saying? All right, that's, what, that's the goal. That's, that's, the, that's what we are to do while he's gone. Verse 36, Peter doesn't get it. Again, I love Peter. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? <laughs> I love it. Jesus is like, you guys, stop arguing about who's greatest in the kingdom. Tell you what, why don't you help somebody else be great in the kingdom so you're not? But they're not doing that. Peter's like, wait, he's going somewhere? Lord, where are you going? We got to know. Can you tell us what time? Hey, what should we wear? The blue or the white? I mean, I just need to know how to dress for this. And, And he doesn't get it at all. So verse 36, Jesus said, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. I think he's saying this really pointedly to Peter because he's, Peter's going to remember this. Peter, and he's, but he's not t- telling it so direct, but really Jesus is saying, Peter, I'm going to the cross and you can't come with me. But someday you're going to go to your own cross and you will be killed. And we know from John 21 that happens, that's going to happen. Peter is going to be brought to a cross. His arms will be outstretched. Tr- church tradition says that As Peter was being nailed to the cross, uh, his own cross, years later, some 30 years later, Peter said, I am not worthy to be crucified in the same manner as my Savior. Crucify me upside down. That's church tradition. I don't know. Could be true. Sounds like Peter, right? Sounds like him. This is not good enough for Peter, that he can't follow Jesus. It's not good enough. Hey, listen. Are you like Peter? Like, you don't give up. Lord, I want to follow you. You can't tell me I can't follow you. I want to follow you no matter what. So don't tell me I can't follow you. I want to be where you are. And then, and then verse 37, Peter knows there's danger wherever Jesus, because I think Peter's thinking, Jesus, you're going to go someplace scary and you might get killed? Um, Here's what Peter says, verse 37. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. I will die with you. Jesus, if you let me go step by step with you, if they kill you, they can kill me at the exact same time. I don't want to be away from you. I love you that much. I want to be near to you all the time. And Peter's got great intention. Hey, everybody. What's easier? Is it easier to say, Lord, I will lay down my life for you when you're in an upper room and it's well lit. You just had a tasty meal. You had lots of fun fellowship with your, fun, with your friends. And, um, and you're very safe and secure up there. Or is it easier to say, Lord, I will give my life for you when you're in a dark garden and there's a mob of, of hostile soldiers with lanterns, with flames and torches and, and weapons? Where is it easier to say, Lord, I'll give my life for you? Uh, it's easier to say it in the upper room. Because what's going to happen in the garden? The disciples will all scatter. Peter's going to make a flailing attempt to do something about the mob. But he fails, and he takes off and runs like the rest of them. Can you imagine Jesus in the garden? When we get to John 18, we'll see it. Jesus is in the garden. He's chained. And there's a guy with his ear lopped off that he just healed. And then he's looking at him like, where's Peter? Where's Peter? Oh, there he goes. Man, is that guy fast. <laughs> I mean, Peter... He, he means well. He doesn't get it. You guys, it is easy in this group right here to say, Lord, I will serve you with my whole heart. I will do whatever you want me to do. It's easy to say that right here. But I'll tell you what, you get out there when you want your own plans and your own affections and your own desires, it's very hard to follow through. Very hard to follow through. 
easy to say, I'm a Christian here, but you go into your school classroom with people who don't love Jesus and then try to say to them, hey, I'm a Je- I love Jesus, I follow Jesus. Much harder to say it here or out there than it is right here, right? So this is what's going on. Peter's willing to give his life up for Jesus, and it sounds great, and, but Jesus knows his heart. Verse 38, Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Peter, not only will you not give your life for me, but before the, the rooster crows, um, it would crow a couple of times during the night, and maybe you live next to a neighbor who has a rooster, I don't know, but um, they do keep you up, I guess. Um, but so Peter's like, Jesus is like, Peter, you're going you're gonna to deny you even know me three times. You're not ready to give your life to me yet. Hey, question, does Peter ever get ready to give his life for the Lord? Yeah, you bet he does. But not right now. He's not there yet. Um, he's going to be, though, someday. And sure enough, he does end up denying the Lord three times. Chapter 14. Let's do this. I'm going to give you some promises now as we kind of apply this text. We're gonna, I'm going to give you some promises. All of that was kind of like a big pro, prologue. And I gave you a command. What's the command? Love one another. As Christ has loved you, you also must love one another. It is not an option. It is, so I just gave you one command. Sorry, I didn't give you a clean outline. Number one, a command. Love one another. Here are some promises. Chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. Don't let your guts, your heart, your inner man be stirred up full of anxiety because your life is going to come crashing down around you. Everything that you thought would happen is not going to happen, and it's going to produce some kind of anxiety and pressure and uh, discomfort in your life. Don't let your heart be in that state. What's the response? How do we get out of that state of anxiety? Here it is. Believe in God believe also in me. I do believe those are both two imperatives. Believe in God. Trust the God of the Bible, the God of the Old Testament, because when they thought of God, they thought of God in the Old Testament. We can trust the God of Daniel. Hey, he took care of the lion's den. We can trust the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Of course, he he got them out of a fiery furnace. Can we trust the God of the Exodus? Sure. Pharaoh's army was bearing down on them. God protected and delivered them. So Jesus says, Trust in God. Believe. Put your full reliance upon God. And he says, you can also equally put your full confidence in me. Why? Because he is God. Jesus is saying, put your full confidence in me. Uh, any Mormon, any Jehovah's Witness, any Muslim, you, they have to be able to look at this text and say, Jesus is saying, you have trusted in God. You can equally, with the same amount of confidence, Trust me, which means Jesus has to be what? He has to be God. No doubt, no question. I had the opportunity to witness to a a Pakistani Muslim yesterday, two days ago, with these young men. We were all standing at the Muslim booth, and uh, uh, we had Melissa's grandmother's funeral yesterday, so uh, Matt, Jaden, and Elias, uh, I took them down Friday. We went to the state fair, went to a hotel, and then the next day, yesterday, we had Melissa's grandmother's funeral gathering, and so uh, these young men were part of it all. But we, during the state fair, we were talking scripture and witnessing to people. It was amazing. But we're at the stand, and I, I didn't know, what do, you, what do you say to a man who's propagating and teaching the Muslim traditions to all the people? And so I went to him, and I said, I just started a conversation. And I ended up asking him, well, who do you say Jesus is? And he said, oh, we believe in Jesus. Yes, Jesus is a prophet. Of course, of course he's a prophet, and he's a very good teacher. And Jesus himself said he wasn't the one, but there's another prophet to come after Jesus, and he will be the prophet, the big one, the capital P prophet. Jesus, down here. Muhammad, and and I said, but wait a minute. In John 14, Jesus himself said he was God and equal with God. And he said he is the way, the truth, the life, and no one can come to the Father except through Jesus. So he is the only way, no other way. And, And the man... I don't know, what was his response? He kind of just blew it off. He didn't, he didn't, but you know, then you know what he did? He gave me his business card because he lives in Pakistan and he's going back in January. I told him I had been in Pakistan last year and I'm going again. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, I, and I said, where do you live in Pakistan? And he goes, Kasur. And I'm like, I was in Kasur. 
And I stayed in Mangamundi, which is a half an hour from Kasur. He goes, here's my home address. Here's my number. When you get to Pakistan, you call me, and I will you come to my house and eat with me. And I said, I will be there. And I'm, I'm going to witness and testify to Jesus Christ to his whole family. And how exciting. But this man, I, I quoted John 14. He's like, no, no. I don't, I, he didn't say that, but he brushed it off. But this is powerful, you guys. Believe in God, that's a command. You must believe in God, but you must equally believe in Jesus Christ, who is God. And then he goes on, verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. All right, this is kind of confusing. We get the idea, remember in Sunday school? I don't know, I didn't go to Sunday school. I bypassed all those years. I didn't get saved to 26. I don't even remember Sunday school at the other church. But, you know, I think there's, I don't know, are there flannel graphs of heaven and then there's mansions inside of heaven? And, hey, we all get our own mansion over the hilltop. And I want one that's like, oh, I want it as big as possible. And I'd like a grand piano in the center, tuned A to the 440. And then, uh, Lord, I'd like a swimming pool and a little hot tub. And, um, Lord, I'd like the sun to always be shining. Uh, I'd like it aimed toward, aim toward the south. And I, 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 you know, we get the idea that, hey, I'm getting a mansion over the hilltop, and it is going to be fun. Who, I mean, that's kind of weird. Do you really want to live alone for all eternity? You know, is, can I live with Melissa? I don't think so, but because we're married here but not up there. I mean, how does all that work? I don't know. But that is not the idea. That is n- the word mansions is a word in the English that I don't think accurately represents the Greek. The Greek word is this. In my father's house are many permanent dwelling places. So people in the English, in the old English, thought permanent dwelling place, hmm, that's not like 5906 Helm Road. That's more like a ghetto in the, in the, in the, in the area. But, but uh, so they were thinking permanent dwelling place, heaven, it's got to be a mansion, like a big thing, big structure. That's, that's not the right word. It's permanent dwelling place. Let me ask you this. 2 Corinthians 5. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, I right now am dwelling in a tent. This is a tent. Are tents permanent or temporary? Very temporary. This body is temporary. Right now it's 52 and it's heading to 100 quickly. But um, I don't know how long this body is going to last, but it is only temporary. Uh, This is not my permanent body. Praise God, I only have a few more years in it. Um, It is wearing out quickly, much like a tent gets some holes and rips and snakes and snarls. So this is happening also to this temporary body. But I am promised in 2 Corinthians 5 a permanent glorified body that I will live in forever. True? Doesn't it make sense? How many father's houses are there? One. And who dwells in his, who dwells in a father's house? His children, his kids. Doesn't it make sense? Jesus says, in my father's house, in God's house up in heaven, there are many permanent dwelling places. There are many glorified bodies. Makes sense. I'm going to be a son in the heavenly home in a glorified permanent body. I'm, I'm going to live forever in this body. Maybe I'll get an apartment. Maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll live all together in one big happy unit. But uh, I don't know what that's like, and I don't even care what that's like. All I know is this. I'm going to get a glorified body that'll be like this forever, and it will never disease. It will never wear out. It'll, it'll never get old. It'll never lose power. It will, for all eternity, glorify and radiate the light of Jesus Christ. That is a guarantee. So Jesus says, here's the first promise. You have the promise of a secure future. It is a guarantee. Don't be troubled by the earth's situations. When I leave and you 11 disciples are alone, don't let your heart be troubled. You have a a guaranteed secure future. In my Father's house are many glorified bodies. All who believe in me will be raised up in glory and dwell with my Father. If it were not so, Jesus said, I would have told you that's not coming, but I've been telling you it's coming, right? It's a guarantee. You are promised a guaranteed glorious future in a glorified body. Then he says this, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. So you want to know the second promise? We get one right after another. You got the promise of a guaranteed future, a secure future. Uh, The second thing, you get the promise uh, in verse 2 of a a prepared place. So Jesus says this, if I go, um, at the end of verse 2, I go to prepare a place for you. Where is he going? Again, misconception number two. Jesus did not go up to heaven, and he's like, okay, I need some two-by-fours, make it heavenly wood, and I want some real strong heavenly nails, and some sandpaper, please, and we'll do some gypsum board. Uh, No, uh, 
Brian likes tongue and groove. Let's get some of the best heavenly tongue and groove. He's not like preparing a place for me up in heaven, like building me a mansion and what kind of windows does he like? And, oh, he's going to die next week. I better get this finished up, get the trim going. He's not preparing a place for me like building me a mansion in heaven. And that's often what we're taught. If I go, you can say this, if I go, I'm sorry, I go to the cross to prepare a place for you. In order for me to dwell in heaven in my father's house, Jesus has to go to the cross. That's how he prepares a place for me. He doesn't build it with his hands with materials in heaven. He goes to the cross and pays for my sin, and by that way, he has prepared a place for me. The only way is through the cross. So if I go to the cross um, and prepare a place for you, he says, the next one, he's, he's going to return. What's the next promise? He will come for me. So a great promise. Verse 3, I will come again and receive you to myself. Isn't it amazing that the God of glory wants to live with me? And he wants to come to me? He wants, he's going to come to me and bring me to be with him forever. So we have the promise of the return of Christ. So we have a guaranteed future. We have a promise of a guaranteed future. We have a promise of a place in the Father's house. We have the promise of a preparation to get there. And then we have the promise of a return. He is coming again. Now, how's that going to happen? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says this. Jesus right now is in heaven, and all of the believers in the church age who have died are with him. All right? Anybody from Acts 2 and the day of Pentecost until now are up in heaven in, in some type of temporary body. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4 that there will be a voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. So there's going to be a glorious shout, the voice of an archangel, and then a trumpet will blow. Whatever that sounds like, I don't know. And what, what is the shout? It could be arise or, I don't know, some, some type of shout, a voice of the archangel. And then get this, all the dead in Christ will rise because Jesus is coming from heaven for the church and all of our loved ones who are up there now are going to come back with him and their bodies will rise out of the grave and the two will meet up. I don't know when the rapture takes place, if I'm alive, I'd love to be at a, at a graveyard. Sometimes we'll be hanging out at a cemetery. Maybe it'll happen then, Melissa. We'll watch all of these bodies come out of the grave in, in glory, and then they'll, they'll be reunited with their soul and spirit from heaven. And then at the very next moment, before you can even blink your eyes, we who are alive and remain in these earthly bodies will be instantly transformed. And this body that is getting older and weaker day by day will be made into glorious, powerful, uh, honorable image of Christ. Isn't that exciting? That is ta you're talking one great moment. And Jesus said, I will come again. It, how guaranteed is that? You guys, it is more guaranteed that you're going to get home in time for dinner um, today after the service. It is way more guaranteed that it is, it is more guaranteed Jesus is coming for us than you will wake up tomorrow morning because any one of us could die. That's just not, a, there's no guarantee I'm going to live tomorrow. But I am guaranteed he will come for me and for you as well. Isn't that great? What a promise. That where I am, there you may be also. He wants to, he wants to be with us. Verse 4, and where I go, you know. Because he's talked much about heaven. He's going to, he's going, we're going to go to heaven. Where I go, you know, and the way you know. And the way, of course, is through the cross. He said it many times. I will die and be raised from the dead. Now, you've got another question. Verse 5, Thomas said to him, uh, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Totally not getting it. They're kind of like not even listening. And, and so now Thomas is like, uh, you're going to the Father's house. What street was that again? I, I lost the street. Maybe you might have told us. And, and by the way, what city was that? And then, and then how do we get there? Are, are we going to take a chariot? Um, we're going to meet you there later after whatever you have to do, you have to do. And like Thomas isn't getting it. Like many people don't get it. So Thomas is like, Lord, we do not know where you're going. Uh, how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You want the way to the Father's house? I am the way. You don't need a map. By the way, Jaden is phenomenal with the map. Give this guy a map, he can get you to any place. You guys ever get lost? Don't Google or MapQuest. Just call Jaden and say, hey, I'm lost. Where can I go? Guy is great with the map. Jesus says, there's no map to get to heaven. You must have faith in me alone. I am the way. 
You want to get to the Father's house? It's me. Um, Jesus says, I am the truth. There's no lie in me. There's no darkness. I am the truth. Whatever I say is true, and you can believe everything that I say. If I say I'm coming back for you, I am. If I say I go to prepare a place for you, I am doing that. And then he is the life. You want eternal life? You want to never perish again? It's Jesus only. He's exclusive. There's no other way. There's no other prophet. There is no other God. There's no other anybody. It is Jesus alone, always, forever. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So verse 7, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. He's like, I've told you all about my Father. I told you you're going there. I told you I'm going to come and bring you there someday. Any questions, class? All right, and of course, they have a question. Verse 8, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's sufficient for us. Hey, uh, we got to get it now. We're going to the Father's house. You're going to go someplace. You're going to pick us up later. But we just got a good question. What, what, show us the Father. Who is he? What does he look like? Uh, we know you. We, we know how you eat. We know how you snore. We know everything about you, Jesus, but we do not know the Father. So show us the Father, and then we'll just get a little, another, another piece of the puzzle will come in. Now let me ask you guys one more time. Ready, class? Everybody here at Faith Baptist, how many gods do we worship? One. Not two, not three, one God, three persons, one divine essence. So Jesus now says that, verse 9, have I, have I been with you so long and you have not known me, Philip? In other words, if you say you don't know the Father, then you're saying you don't know me because the Father and I are one. There's only one God. And yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Again, if you have seen Jesus Christ, although he's a different person than the Father, if you've seen God, the Son, Jesus Christ, well, then you've seen God, the Holy Spirit, and you've seen God, the Father. Although they are invisible, Jesus is the full representation of the Godhead. If you've seen God, if you've seen Jesus Christ, then you have no need to see the Father or the Spirit. There's one God. So when we get to heaven, do you think we'll ever see the Holy Spirit? I don't think so, ever. Will we know his presence? Absolutely. Uh, will we ever see the Father, like in visible form? I don't think so. He dwells in unapproachable light. But if we've seen Jesus, we've seen the Father, and we've seen God. That's all we need. Amazing, isn't it? Verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? That, that we are one God? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe in me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So he's saying, you guys, either believe that I'm God, I'm one with the Father, believe it by the miracles I've done, believe it by my teaching. By the way, my teaching and miracles all come from the Father, so if you believe my miracles, you believe in my Father. But either way, we're one God. Will you trust me? Will you believe me? And then verse 12, he gives us this great, great promise. Here's the last promise. He gives us the promise of supply. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, this is a hard text. It's confusing, but let's walk through it quickly, and then we'll, then we'll be dismissed. Verse 12. Most assuredly, truly, truly, without a doubt, you can believe this. I say to you, Jesus says, he who believes in me, a true believer, someone whose faith is in Jesus Christ alone, apart from works or religion, the works that I do, he will do also. Don't get confused. Don't think because Jesus walked on water, you can walk on water. He's, he's not saying the miracles I performed, you can also perform. I raised the dead, you guys can raise the dead. I healed the sick, you can heal the sick. That's not what he's saying. Every single miracle revealed what? It revealed the Father. Why did Jesus come? He says in the Gospel of John, Jesus came to reveal the Father. He was already physically in front of them. He didn't come to reveal himself. He came to reveal that there is a God the Father, and the only way to the Father is have your sins paid, and the only way to get your sins paid is I do it on a cross for you. So everything Jesus did, every work and every word, revealed the Father. And then Jesus said, if you believe in me, then you're going to do the same thing. Hey, you guys going to school this week. 
Every time you talk about Jesus in school, every time you talk to a friend and say, hey, here's what I've been learning in the Bible. Do you, do you know this? Have you heard this before? This is true. Every time you do that, you're revealing God the Father. And then you're letting them know, we have all sinned and we have no access to heaven or the Father. The only access is through Jesus Christ, who is God, and his death on the cross for our sins. That is a great thing. And then he goes on and he says, and greater works than these he will do. What does it mean that we'll be able to do greater works? Is there anything greater than revealing the Father? Well, the answer is this. Jesus, when he was on earth, was one person preaching the message. Even the 12, were, the 12 preached it, but, but they didn't have the indwelling power of the Spirit. They didn't have all of that. Now look at what happened. Jesus goes to heaven. There's 120 followers. The Holy Spirit comes upon them. They reveal the gospel message to a bunch of people. They get saved. Then more people get saved. And then 2,000 years later, look at us. 2,000 years later, we're a product of the preaching of the first century. Do you know that? That is a great work that so many of his children could reveal the Father to so many people. Jesus, if he, was, if he was on earth right now, how many people could he preach to at one time? Whoever came to hear him in a stadium. The rest of the world wouldn't get him unless it was on TV, right? But here, all of us have interaction with our neighbors, our coworkers, the people at school, and, and we are actually accomplishing the revealing of the Father in a, in a bigger, expansive way than Jesus did when he was on earth. It doesn't mean that we're greater than Jesus, it's just that means we're a part of his plan of, of proclaiming the gospel. And then look at this very last thing, verse 13. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And again, people pull that out of context and say, hey, I just prayed for a million dollars. Then God has to give me a million dollars. Oh, I said in Jesus' name. I'd like a million dollars in Jesus' name. Hey, it's going to happen. He said, if I ask in his name, it will happen to me. That is not the idea. In the context, it's revealing the Father. I will guarantee this. Hey, you guys, I guarantee this. If you pray today and tomorrow and on Tuesday and Wednesday, if you pray and say, Lord, today is a new day. It's Monday morning, and I want to reveal the Father to this lost world. The world is blind and separated from you, but I have the good news of Jesus. So I'm going to ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim your word so that people could hear about the Father and they will believe in Jesus and, and be able to go to heaven through Jesus. That lines up perfectly with God's will, and he is going to do something. Last thing. In 1857, it's part of my seminary class I just finished, so I'm going to tell you what I learned. <laughs> you guys, in 1857, it was the third awakening in America. There were two before that in the 1700s, right before we became a nation. For one to two to three years, there were short awakenings, the first and the second. Hence, we call it the third in 1857. In 1857, James Lamphere was in a reformed, reformed uh, Fulton Street Reformed Dutch Church in New York City, and he said to his wife, let's pray. Let's pray for the salvation of, the, of our city. And he said, let's open up to everybody to come on Wednesday to our church for prayer. And we're going to pray according to God's will that to the entire city of New York, the Father would be revealed to them through Jesus Christ. And so they started at noon, and they said it's going to be a one-hour prayer meeting. And him and his wife are sitting there, and it's noon. Nobody else. We're praying. Let's pray. So they're praying, and then a person walks in, and then maybe at 1220, another person walks in. And by 1 o'clock, six people. That's it. Six people. They didn't give up. They're like, okay, next week. We got six. That's great. Next week, we'll do it again at noon, Wednesday at noon. Now it's 12 people. And then the next week, they're like, we're going to keep this going, and we're going to keep praying. And all they did was pray. They just prayed and said, Lord, we've got the gospel, and this city is wicked. They are blinded. They don't know you. They don't love you, and they are going to perish. You have given us a heart for them. Now give us the boldness and the words to say it. And let the Holy Spirit go before us and convict them of their sin. And pretty soon, 100 people, 120 people. And, and next thing you know, business people all across New York City are closing their doors at noon on Wednesday every single week. And now they're moving the prayer meetings to different places. And within two years, from 1857 to 1859, about a million people have now gotten saved. Not that much in a big country like ours, even at that time, but that is huge. And then from there, 
it went over, to, it spread to England, and then it came back, and it just took off with wildfire, not the prayer meeting anymore, but different meetings. Actually, a meeting like what's held at Tim and Ann's, it was called Believer's Study Meetings, where they met at somebody's house, like we do at Tim and Ann's, and they got groups and groups and people, and then pretty soon one was here and another one was here, and then it turned into a Bible conference, and many, many people got saved, and it was a great awakening in America. And then it just stopped. And we haven't had anything since then. And it's 2000, almost 2020. Wouldn't it be great if we prayed according to his name and said, Lord, you want people saved way more than I do. We'll just pray and ask you to save them. We're going to come to you and say, Lord, save them and use us. Use us, give us opportunity, and we will pray. And we will ask for your power. We are completely dependent upon your supply. You have promised a supply of the Holy Spirit, and we will do it. See, notice, we're not asking for an easy life, lots of vacations. I want more um, time off. I really wish my boss would be better. I wish I didn't feel so sick. I wish I had less disease or less aches and pains. None of that. It was, it, and it should be, Lord, our goal is to reveal the Father, whatever condition we are, and let it be done. Isn't that exciting? All right, well, that's the first part of this. This is what he's telling the disciples in the upper room right before he goes to the cross. If you are here today without Jesus, trust him. Believe in him, or you, and you will, have, you will be given eternal life. You will live forever in the Father's house. If you don't trust him, the Bible says you will perish. And then as believers, just have hope. Don't be anxious. You have a guaranteed future. He's coming back for you. He has prepared a place for you. He's given you the perfect supply for everything that we need to do here on earth. We do not lack anything. Father in heaven, thank you for this time in your word. And, and I know there's so much to these to these texts, but we just want to be able to catch the whole heartbeat of Jesus in the upper room now. And I know the disciples at this point are really confused, and they don't know where they're going, and they don't even know the way to get there, and they're, they're, they're so busy with the details of earthly life that they're missing the whole point. And, and sometimes we get the same way. We're busy about our lives and our careers and our families and our vacations and our times that we almost forget that our goal for being here is to reach the lost, is to let people know that there is a Savior who died for them, and they must know him to have eternal life. And so, Father, I pray that we would pray, first and foremost, we would pray, that we would gather at 8.30 to pray on Sunday mornings for the, all the people that will come here and the people that will hear online, and, and then that will grow and expand. And, and Father, maybe even some kind of fourth awakening could, could start here or someplace, and then, and then we would just join in and together the believers will change the culture of our country and no longer will our culture be one of greed and materialism and a lack of, of, um, a lack of respecting life. Oh, it just We can think of what the gospel would do to our country right now. It would be an incredible thing. You can do it, Father. You've done it in the past and you can do it again. We ask you to use us. We want to be faithful servants of yours, followers of Jesus. So for anybody today with anxiety, crushing weight, troubled hearts. Let them find hope in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you. Tonight we'll have, as you heard, the Lord's Supper, and then we'll continue on with this last half of John 